the larger learning which we have taken uh, since the covid started it's been that it's been that um, it's 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 uh, that uh, there have been three large trends which have which we have seen emerge over the past uh, past a few weeks the first has been with regard to the general environment which is being there so uh, i think uh, with the lockdown which is indeterminate right now and it's that sense of uh, uh, indeterminacy uh, by itself uh, the pandemic is leading to a environment of fear and while there are legitimate reasons why certain civil liberties are being restricted there is almost a sense of uh, surrender where people are giving them up with a greater amount of willingness than they were ever before and we have heard this more often than not um, than not uh, which is a very unfortunate way how people are phrasing it is that extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures right but um, if those extraordinary measures by themselves lead to a closure of civic space in which quite often uh, fundamental rights which are supposed to be perennial which means that they need to be everlasting and in fact need to be much more strongly asserted in these challenging times right uh, citizen collectives and fundamental rights organizations become more important and the work which is being done today is being done in an environment in which there is a physical restriction which is also playing out in the institutional responses which are available so while the political center expands its power okay and there's a huge amount of centralization of power the traditional checks which you see for instance parliamentary bodies such as standing committees or you look at how um, uh, the courts are there all of that it's not functioning normally it's an extraordinary situation so in this environment where people are losing more and more hope what is iff doing and how are we dealing with this pandemic in terms of big picture thinking the three key learnings we have taken away is that number one is that pace is key we need to do things which are higher amount of um, uh, uh, of uh, 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 in terms of being more rapid being more uh, execution oriented and you may have seen it in our work and i think staff will talk about it in some times but it's just not about iff it's about activating a range of actors beyond iff who can complement each other's work and this becomes important because technology today is not only restricted to digital rights as a defined body of organizations which may be about 8 or 10 organizations digital rights in fact uh, impact the right to access to the internet for instance and thereby impact healthcare thereby impact especially in times of covid or remote learning so how do you grow the number of actors and make digital rights also flatter the same way technology and its impacts are becoming flatter and these distributed models of activation where people self start and organizations which have been traditionally in other areas all coalesce around common goals is one key learning which we have taken through and this requires us to make our work more public centered and it came across very clearly in the feedback which we got from members in the survey that we did uh shivani if you can also post the survey here in a link so members can also read it side by side what did others say in the community that iff should be focusing on more and more and the responses there as i said earlier in the call were completely anonymous we didn't gather any data from our members as to who was saying what okay now uh, at the same point in time you do need to engage with institutions and i know things don't look very optimistic but when you engage with institutions with good faith persistently and you understand that their democratic framework is under a level of stress at the same point of time if you have the best talent and if you map the government the judiciary or the parliamentary bodies by itself are not one homogeneous block there are opportunities both in substance and processes where you can if you are if you have the right talent resources you can spot opportunities to engage and even win and this brings me to 
how this is actually being implemented, this big picture thinking. So I would like Shivani, who's our operations and community uh, 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 community manager, who more often than me talks to you to take over from me now. Okay, God willing, you should be able to you should be able to see me now and hear me as well. Yeah, okay. it's all good, Shivani. Go ahead. Well, thankfully. So hi everyone. I am so glad you could join us today, and it's great meeting all of you um, virtually under the circumstances. Uh, I'm Shivani. I am also the youngest staffer at IFF. Um, like Apar mentioned, I head operations and community for the organization. Um, so IFF, since its inception, has always been community centric. And one of the things that I'm working towards constantly is to expand our community and find newer ways to engage with people, uh, in uh, with, with newer people and audience. Um, one of the ways that we came up with was to launch the Internet Freedom Forum. Um, we launched it on the 19th of Feb and now have over 300 active members. The idea behind this was to bring everyone who's interested in digital rights, uh, to bring them together so they can get to know each other. It was also so we can gather ideas from the community and ask for help. Uh, you might have noticed that we ask a lot of questions on there as well, mostly tech related. In fact, uh, this whole big blue button setup was also made possible after a member on the forum reached to us and helped us set the entire thing up. Um, one of the other ways that we have been reaching out to people in the past has been via IFF events. Um, in the pre-COVID world, we started doing one event per month in the IFF office itself in Delhi. Uh, we hosted people like Kushal Dev and uh, Professor Rohit Day in our office. Um, how, uh, but, but we're probably not going to be able to do that for a while now. So considering COVID and we're all locked down. Um, so we've transitioned to online events. So apart from speaking at events organized by uh, other organizations, we're also partnering up with people for IFF webinars with some really cool people from Live Law, Suno India, Has Geek, Takshashila, et cetera. Um, the goal currently is to host at least one IFF webinar per week. And we will also be announcing the next one soon. Um, Insider info, it's got to do with facial recognition. You heard it here first. Um, <laughs> fun stuff. Uh, I mean, but honestly, um, events and forum is, is, is a really fun part of my job, and I really enjoy doing it. But the community has also been tangibly involved in contributing to projects that IFF has been working on. One major example of that is our work with Datakind Bangalore. Uh, we're working on them. Uh, on Project Panoptic to map the spread of facial recognition technology in the country. Um, and our volunteers are going to be a massive part of this project. And we're working on it currently. And I'm so excited for all of you to see it. Um, apart from all this, I also head operations. And I'm working towards building sustainable systems uh, internally at IFF that ensure the, present, the, the well-being of all present and future IFF employees. Uh, it also includes making sure we're up to date on our transparency and compliances and, and all of that stuff. Um, and I think that is enough from me now. I will give the floor back to Apar. I okay. Know to okay. So, uh, uh, I, I, you know, what was the aspiration here? The aspiration was that, hey, uh, member calls are so boring and like we just read off a PPT. So let's let's do something which is a little more interactive. So it'll just help all of us to get feedback every now and then in the public chat chat box. Are we going in the right direction? Uh, and if you have questions also, and if you have questions specifically for Shivani or any of the staffers who come on and you just want to type it, you want to have a chat with the other members, please go ahead. For the next slide, we're now going to look at operational resilience in the sense that how will IFF remain sustainable and hit these peaks again and again and it speaks to another question which was brought up and repeatedly i noticed in the uh, survey form which we put out through block survey people were saying that iff is still restricted within a silos or digital rights itself in which mostly the people who know these issues come from a very high degree of uh, intellectual learning or uh, social learning privilege or access to technology by itself, theoretical material. So how do you make this more popular? And I think there's nobody better uh, who can explain both. How does IFF grow the pool for itself in terms of resources to execute this, but also complements it with the same community way thinking 
in terms of reaching out to more people who have never ever had a conversation, a serious conversation about privacy. And for that, there's nobody better than Farkanda to actually have this conversation with you. Farkanda is, if you've seen what our tonality, how it's improved, how we are speaking a much better language, it's it's because of her. So Farkanda, if you can please come on this um, and uh, tell people uh, uh, the, all the brilliant work which people have been seeing over the past few weeks and months. Uh, hi, Apar. I think uh, you can tell me now. Just give me a second. I'm just sharing my video. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, I'll uh, just give you a give everyone a brief overview of how it's been for all of us. Uh, so. Uh, I'm Farkanda, guys, and I ha I handle communications and fundraising for IFF. I it's been a couple of months. I joined in February, so uh, yeah, uh, I'll I'll tell you how it is for me. So my work starts right from uh, the donation appeals that we make, and uh, and it ends with the sending out of the APGs. So right from the donation appeals till the sending out of APGs, I'm responsible for all of that. And uh, 2020 for IFF has been phenomenal we have grown to around 172 members from 94 in december if i'm correct and uh, we've had over 700 one-time donations in the past four months uh, we've also received uh, three organizational donations and we've also uh, uh, hosted a couple of fundraisers since uh, the beginning of this uh, year uh, we've yeah. also Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Amod Malvia from yeah. Oran, who, 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 as a technologist, and this is also one of our core strengths, and we are hoping to deepen that as we go forward, is to engage proactively with technologists in India and promote this digital rights, not only uh, by conversation, events, but also by them becoming a part of this organization by helping us fundraise. Please continue. So uh, yeah, thank you, Amod. Amod Amod's not here, but yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, Amod matched up. Uh, we had a, a fundraiser in March, and Amod uh, matched up uh, till three lakhs. So yeah, we were able to raise um, six lakhs in the month. I mean, more than six lakhs in the month of March. So uh, yeah, we uh, we've also received three organizational donations uh, with. We've tried, we're, we're trying to uh, maintain a balance of equal funds coming in both from individuals and organizations. So we've raised an amount of around 20 lakhs this quarter, which is more than ever. And so, yes, we are growing. Uh, and uh, we also have a growing community of volunteers. Our members are growing, of course, but we have a growing community of member volunteers as well who help us on uh, multiple fronts. We have lawyers, technologists. We have a lot of designers also on board who uh, volunteer to you know design for us. In fact, we are working on a couple of collaborations with uh, artists. So you'll see that soon. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have some people from the tech policy sector as well. Also, we uh, have started focusing uh, on improvising our social media st strategy so uh, that we can reach as many people as we can, because like Apar says, we, we are trying to bridge the gap between public policy and the public. So that's what we are trying to do. Uh, so we started doing more informative, quick explainers to complement our long pieces or the blog posts, which uh, uh, would be a little difficult for our audience to analyze otherwise. So uh, yeah, our social media following is also going up. and. Uh, We've uh, started making videos. So we started shooting and editing videos when the log after the lockdown started. So that's uh, that's helping us, like you know, um, um, reach more people. So uh, yeah, we're trying our best, but uh, there's still a long way to go. And please uh, let us know if there's any way you think we can do better. If you think we can, you know, um, improvise. Please, uh, you know, either. Uh, um, uh, leave a uh, in the chat in the chat box. Leave a uh, question or any uh, advice or any suggestions that you might have. So yeah. Thank you so much. And um, I think uh, um, uh, Karthik has joined. Karthik's our other board co-chair along with Raman. And um, hey Karthik, and your message was read by everyone. 
and uh, the use of emojis is very well appreciated that is something we really try to strive for okay so all messages uh, should be um, uh, there um, uh, vishwanathan sir we'll take questions towards the end and just like vishwanathan sir please everyone who have expectations and um, and suggestions for us please go ahead so next slide deals with the actual actual work which you see tangibly on the front end and if you've seen the covid related working paper all the rti is being put out that's being done by siddharth and anushka siddharth is the policy and parliamentary council where he's engaging not only with government bodies but also with uh, parliamentary bodies standing committees and you may have seen what's happening there a bit on a social media and also the rts for instance is the arogya setu source code uh, open sourced etc all those kind of rts are being filed so uh, i would like to invite my colleagues anushka and siddharth also to um, take turns and uh, say, and also tell how are we winning in this environment are we even winning I hope I'm audible at this stage, and uh, I'm just trying to get my webcam to start working. Uh, Siddharth, you audible? Okay, that's great. Just give me a moment. Hopefully, my ca camera also cooperates as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Siddharth, and as Apar indicated, I work as the policy and parliamentary council at IFF. Uh, I joined in Feb, and it's been a rather uh, uh, fast-paced three months since joining, and it's been a lot of work, and it's been really fruitful. So I'll try and take through exactly what we've tried to fulfill in the last three months. And one of the big challenges with public policy in India is trying to convert something which the general public views as a rather abstract construct into meaningful tangible outcomes and trying to get as apar was referencing small wins here, incremental wins here and there uh, uh, to take the conversation so to speak forward so when it comes to the policy policy and parliamentary engagement we have a certain limited of consistent in, in, uh, engagement on specific uh, points one is consistently participating in government consultations and putting forth the views of the public and smaller businesses in consultations like, for instance, uh, when I joined, there were a couple of consultations on network neutrality and on data protection. So we we put forth all of the learnings that we take, uh, take from months in advance and we submit them to not only the relevant government department or the regulator, but also to strategically the stakeholders as well who are relevant to the conversation itself. Then similarly, we're also trying to diversify and not just look at purely civil liberties sort of issues, but more on the innovation side as well. So we've also participated in a government consultation on a draft amendment to India's con competition laws as well. So that, those are more medium term sort of engagements, and we complement that with consistent uh, rapid responses as well, where we send formal legal representations or letters to government functionaries. And that's where both uh, Anushka and I uh, tend to uh, follow exactly what are the sort of steps government, even at the, the center and the state are trying to do. And uh, wherever we believe that there is a need for immediate intervention to get some sort of course correction happening, we send a rapid response out to the relevant functionary. And then another bit of con uh, uh, consistent work that we consist uh, we uh, proactively do, and this is something that Anushka uh, really drives within IFF, is our RTI-related work. And as the pre uh, slide itself indicates, we've really upped our game in the last few months with respect to the RTI filing. And Anushka, if you want, you may wish to talk a little bit about our RTI-related work in the last few months at this stage. Anushka. Hi guys. Um, it's great to be on this call. I'm doubly interested in this call as in addition to being staff, uh, staff uh, member. I'm also a member at IFF. Um, uh, as Siddharth was saying, uh, my main work is uh, in filing and maintaining the RTIs at IFF. So we have been consistently filing RTIs uh, with regard to everything that has been going on uh, with regard to the facial recognition 
that they have uh, uh, in use with regard to drones and now with regard to the arogya setu surveillance and also other surveillance that has been going on so that one of the main uh, tasks uh, that i do at iff in addition to that i also uh, sadhat with regard to representations and the response as you just said um my other main uh, task at iff is is to um, work on two projects uh, these are the zombie trap uh, tracker project and project panoptic uh, zombie tracker is our um, project that tracks the legal zombie that is 66a uh, this term was coined by apar why we call it a zombie because uh, was it not apar you're on mute uh, so uh, the reason we call it a legal zombie is because even though it was declared unconstitutional in 2015 66a is still being used and uh, uh, this project we are tracking why this is happening how much this is happening and what we can do once we have all this data the second project is the panoptic and find that project panoptic uh, mission projects all over the country uh, that have deployed the ones that development stage the first stage right now which we are at in which tracking these and getting mission as much as we can with regard to uh, the next building eyes uh, the next stage is to launch a pump and which will uh, mainly have an interactive on which people would be to go and see the spatial objects so those are our tasks at iff and um, now i think i will uh, give the floor part uh before we give it back to apart just a couple of more things that i'd really like to highlight with respect to our policy related work one is that we're trying to complement our civil civil liberty interventions also with more proactive engagement with government authorities and regulators so that can be demonstrated by our work with respect to trying to build up or uh, expand the reach of meaningful internet connectivity within india and towards that we're trying to figure out uh, ways to try and uh, get uh, so for instance during covid-19 as the world has moved towards you know work from home distance learning and so on and so forth uh, there has been a shift in uh, ne network traffic towards like home internet connections and there have been shift in pressures on underlying network infrastructure so we've been trying to have a meaningful dialogue with both the department of telecommunications and the telecom regulatory authority of india in trying to figure out how to uh, deal with the shifts in network uh, network traffic uh, and and having a dialogue with all stakeholders but ensuring that that does not come at the cost of let's say a principle a core public internet principle like network neutrality so we're trying to learn from what other countries are also trying to do and shaping those shaping those learnings to the uh, situating it within the indian context and putting forth those sort of uh, representations to both the dot and try and we're also talking about the fact that now that since citizens are a lot more reliant on on uh, information and communication technologies like the internet we need to figure out ways how to use funds which are available with the government of india uh, to try and not only have last mile access to telecom infrastructure or internet infrastructure but to also like basic uh, user side devices like smartphones and smarter devices or internet enabled devices and so on and so forth that's one and the second thing is uh, the last thing that i'd like to emphasize is we're trying to ensure that both our rapid responses or even our long form work have some tangible outcomes that can be uh, that can be absorbed uh, absorbed by government and also translate into meaningful action in a short time horizon so i'll give you two examples of our work there one was when the delhi riots took place in uh, february earlier this year we uh, we realized that there is a certain data sharing policy that's taking place within the transport ministry which there is scope for abuse where malicious actors may use them to target mi mi uh, minority communities noticing that gap in the data sharing policy 
the same day we shared a representation with the transport ministry the home ministry and uh, various functionaries within the De delhi state government itself because of the fact that we were uh, we were rapid in our response we targeted the pro problem in a concise uh, uh, methodical sort of manner we uh, we got a sort of uh, acknowledgement by different government uh, officials that yes this is an issue to look at and then like less than 24 hours later we saw a report in a major national daily that the transport ministry had confirmed to that national daily that they will take me some sort of incremental immediate measures to protect people's privacy to the extent where malicious actors don't have unregulated access to that data so that was one meaningful win that we observed during this quarter now even when it comes to our longer form work where we do devote like uh, more resources to a particular output like the working paper that apar was referencing uh, with respect to arogya setu contact tracing and other technology deployments during uh, during covid-19 we've chosen that because we feel that that is an issue of great public uh, urgency and we believe that if you target that in a nuanced way with uh, an overwhelm government functionaries with irrefutable evidence they their sort of, sort of their hand will be forced by the evidence to take corrective measures in a faster horizon so what we've noticed uh, that after the in initial publication of the working paper uh, uh, the government has made certain changes within its privacy policy of the arogya setu app to one uh, mitigate reduce or remove third party access to uh, people's data from the pri uh, privacy policy itself and to tighten the language vis-a-vis -vis the uh, number of days within which people's data must be uh, deleted after initial collection so while those are limited uh, limited win at least we are noticing that it uh, our work is eliciting faster response by the government itself and that shows that these strategies do have certain tangible outputs and we're just going to double down over the course of the next quarter to try and emphasize that these are our asks and there is enough evidence which supports that our asks are meaningful are in fact solution oriented not just saying that what the government is doing is incorrect but also putting forth solutions so that the government can take our ideas and maybe more quickly translate that into action as well and that is the sort of strategy that we're taking with a lot of this work vis-a-vis -vis covid we will obviously as i've mentioned before complement these interventionist uh, interventionist positions with proactive engagement as well in building up at least the innovation side of things when it comes to information communication technologies and i'll leave it here for apart to take it forward just just one point i wanted to add to that is that our parliamentary engagement was also growing and we reach out to parliamentarians quite often this cuts across party lines and we've also deposed for parliamentary standing committees so um, uh, one such instance is the dna uh, bill where uh, i myself uh, presented evidence and uh, let's see how that report comes out uh, okay now just going forward with the next co vertical of our work which excites a large number of our um, of our community i'd like to invite devdatta and brinda bhandari onto this and um, dev uh, i know that uh, you have limited time so whenever you do need to go off i can pick it up uh, for both you and uh, or, or for brinda whichever hi brinda hi uh, why don't you take this on yeah hi uh, my name is Brinda. Uh, it's great to be on this call. So just to give you a bit of background about myself, uh, I'm an independent counsel uh, and I work uh, in Delhi and I work on privacy and technology issues, but I'm also the off counsel for IFF. I've had the lucky privilege of working with Raman and Apar since the time IFF started and it's been a wonderful uh, journey so far. So part of what I do at IFF is look at the litigation uh, portfolio and the litigation uh, docket. And I work with Devdatta on that. So we'll be speaking about two cases primarily today. One is the Jammu and Kashmir petition that we had filed in the Supreme Court for restoration of 4G internet in Jammu and Kashmir and the recent challenge to the Arogya Setu app. So Devdatta will be speaking about the Arogya Setu challenge. And I'll just give you uh, a very quick background about what happened in the Kashmir challenge. So we had initially filed an intervention in January, uh, in uh, October 2019, when there was a complete communication shutdown in Jammu and Kashmir. We had filed an intervention in Anuradha Basin, 
uh, on the quest on the fact that the communication shutdown was unconstitutional uh, there were a bunch of other interventions that had also been filed and the supreme court gave a comprehensive judgment in january uh, saying that you, you proportionality standards have to apply in communication shutdown cases and uh, ask the government to review the orders this led to a gradual relaxation of the restrictions on internet and we reached a stage where we now have 2g internet access for everyone in kashmir in light of the lockdown and the fact that there was a covid-19 pandemic uh, iff you know at the behest of iff we filed uh, a writ petition so we were the only parties to file a writ petition in the supreme court uh, saying that we actually in light of these conditions internet needs to be restored to jammu and kashmir completely the right to internet is a fundamental right uh, under article 21 it should also include the right to speedy internet was some of the arguments that we made and we uh, used the proportionality standard as the underlying framework for our challenge this was a very interesting litigation because from a strategy point of view we were trying to collaborate with the community as well and one of the things we did in this petition which we've also now done in arogya setu and we hope to use this as a model forward for ifs litigation is actually submit expert affidavits so we submitted two expert affidavits in this case uh, one was uh, by pratik baghre where we spoke where he explained the difference between 2g and 4g internet so this is a very practical affidavit to explain for instance how long does it take to download the arogya setu app on 2g versus 4g internet how long would a video on youtube take to buffer on 2g versus 4g internet uh, one of the interesting things we found was the who dashboard actually does not work on 2g internet at all so we were trying to make this uh you know use this affidavit to show that the restriction of 2g is a very vital restriction it actually almost kills my right to the internet because i am not able to access in any meaningful manner a different parts of the internet uh, so this was one expert affidavit that we that we filed the second affidavit that we filed and because uh, that was partly because this is a pil so one of the things that one has to always be cognizant about is you end up relying on newspaper reports uh so to get around that constraint we actually uh so we, this petition had been filed by the foundation for media professionals so one of the members of the foundation had actually spoken to people on the ground in kashmir and she spoke to 11 people in kashmir and it, and narrated their experiences so the interviews that they gave her she quoted parts of those interviews in her affidavit so this was a very wide ranging affidavit which actually brought to fore the difficulties faced by the people of kashmir so you know she spoke to doctors she spoke to teachers students um parents just explaining how the impact how the kashmir restriction had impacted uh, all of them um and the supreme court has now given an order in this petition and has uh, has essentially disposed of the writ petition by saying that we now have to move before a special committee that has been constituted they did uh, they did acknowledge or impliedly we believe that they rejected the government's a uh, view that because of national security these issues cannot be looked at in any manner we have now filed a representation going forward with the special committee and we are hopeful that things will uh, start opening up soon uh, so this is just one example of how litigation was carried out in the jammu and kashmir matter that's great vrinda and it's so nice to hear that this level of persistence and just being relentless in going after these goals uh, is uh, bearing fruit and a uh, key part of that is what devdatta is doing and right um, and i've they've been very cognizant how both of you have worked through the at least through the past 3 weeks in this lockdown kind of situation over weekends on this kashmir case but also on uh, the arogya setu challenge responding to the concerns of our community so dev uh, the latest one which is on the interest barometer or on the on the very hard red okay where where everyone has a very high degree of interest please um, take one take thing before that uh, because i have to unfortunately log off but one of the things i did want to highlight uh, in terms of how iff is really helping out and i think you know sort of trying to change the way of litigation is that it's not just coming in at the last moment and filing a pil so fmp had actually drafted two representations between azad basin and the second case so this is not a case of you know someone just waking up one day and saying now let's file a petition there was an actual backing we could tell the court that we are not just any third party random interested party we have you know we have been uh, you know speaking to the committee we've been speaking to the secretaries we've been writing to them uh you know putting forth our representations and i think this is very important going forward to distinguish ourselves from a lot of the pios that get filed at the last moment to say that there is a concerted effort and thought behind the petition that has been filed and i think as they will now explain even in the arogya setu the fact that iff then has a draft working paper uh, where they explain the privacy problems is again another example and the rtis that apar and siddharth mentioned is another example of where previous work 
being done by IFF is now being used in litigation. And I think that is the way forward and is a way for IFF to distinguish itself from other litigations and PILs that get filed. Thanks for that, Brinda. I agree with everything that Brinda has said. And just to give you a little bit of background about me, I've been at IFF since March of last year. I started out as an intern and then transitioned into a full-time staffer. So I've really seen IFF's litigation practice grow over the course of the last one year, and it's been very exciting being a part of it. Um, I think Brinda's already talked about a lot of values and principles which underpin our litigation. The first is, of course, is that we're constitutionalist and we believe that you know every citizen has a right uh, to freedom of speech and expression and privacy and that these rights exist to the internet and extend to the internet. Um, the other thing is that we also believe in a very collaborative model of work which Brinda has extensively talked about in the context of the Kashmir case. In the context of the recent Kerala High Court uh, challenge against mandatory use of Arogya Setu, we reached out to Dr. Professor Subhashish Banerjee of IIT Delhi and he agreed to provide a fantastic technical affidavit in the case, which is both generous but also comprehensible for lawyers and judges. And we thought that was a very important part of that petition. Um, in the Kerala High Court, we are providing legal representation to Mr. Jackson Matthew, who is a businessman who is directly affected by the order issued by the Ministry of Home Affairs, which makes the use of the Arogya Setu app mandatory for all employees and then holds the head of the organization responsible. And any failure of the employees to download the app could lead to criminal prosecution of the employer as well. So I think, again, as Brinda mentioned, we've been working on the issue of Arogya Setu for a really long time. It started with Siddharth's working paper. But over the course of the last month, we've seen the function creep and the mission creep and the voluntary turning into mandatory. And when finally criminal penalties were imposed on the 1st of May, that's when you know we realized that okay something needed to be done. And there were petitioners before uh, the there were there was already a petition before the Kerala High Court, and then there were other parties in Kerala who were also interested in challenging uh, the fact that Arogya Setu had been made mandatory. And we provided them legal representation. We also do a lot of coordination work. So for instance, putting technical experts in touch with the petitioner. So all of this evidence can also be included as a part of the record. And it's not just case law and legal citations. So, I mean, that's what we've been up to in the last Dave, few months. And Dave, Dave only... just one question that's because- Dave, you're muted. Is it working now? I can't hear you. Can anyone else hear Apar? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can hear him. Yeah. I can hear I'm guessing there's a problem with my audio. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. Dave, go ahead. That's all right. Yeah, and I would be remiss if I did not mention the fact that we've also been doing something closer to home to Delhi, which is in Noida. And, you know, we've been providing legal assistance and just generally uh, advice to a law based in Noida who's challenged the Section 144 order issued there making Arogya Setu mandatory, again, at risk of criminal penalties. And that's also something we've been working on in the last couple of weeks. Abara, I'll let you take over from here. Uh, thank you so much, Devdatta. I think there's a technical problem uh, in which you may not be able to hear me, but um, I'm uh, I'm cognizant you do have another engagement, so uh, please do uh, take leave if you would like to. And um, um, I'll be taking on questions for litigation also a little later on. And the chat box, Shivani, if you can just uh, also paste the link to our website where all the litigations are listed, that may give a good sense to members that what all we've been up to over these past uh, few months okay and that's also listed so there's a challenge to the website blocking rules that entire petition on um, uh, on traceability and encryption and intermediaries rules um, that was a bit pre-covid and uh, let's let's go to the next uh, and this is the most important part uh, because it concerns the board members and we recently did have a board meeting. So I'll let Karthik and Raman now come on to this and also explain how IFF is deepening its values by the great amount of board discipline and oversight over my functions, but also giving us direction and support uh, at a regular basis. They're really incredible in the amount of time, energy and resources they are putting towards building this up. 
Ayabad, thanks so much for that. Uh, Karthik, if you also want to join, that would be great. So we just introduce us. Hi, so hi guys, I'm Raman Chima. I'm uh, one of the co-founders at IFF, and I currently chair the board uh, along with Karthik, who's our co-chair. Karthik? Yes, hi. Can you guys hear me? Yes, all working well. And so, so the, we, we're a six-member board uh, in total. We right now five people who are quite active, along with the power, who, in addition to being ED, is also a trustee of the of the board. We've been trying to focus a significant amount of our work to supporting the long-term sustainability and efficiency and openness of IFF. I thought we'll give you just a couple of quick updates. Uh, one, of course, anytime you want to reach out on any structural governance or even transparency concern about IFF, don't hesitate. Uh, the staff are very open and apart is quite reachable, but you can always reach out to us at any point of time as well. It's a simple email address, trust, T-R-U-S-T, at the rate, internetfreedom.in. Uh, IFF is structured as a public charitable trust with an income tax exemption granted by the income tax department in India. And what that means is that we regularly file audited tax returns and updates and regulations governing that also apply to us. So some of this stuff is anyway made uh, public, but we we want to go take further steps to give you updates, not just on financials, but also on how we operate. So one decision we took in the last board meeting is to at least uh, is to update with summary takeaways of what we discuss in our board meetings, resolutions, and how the governance of IFF is taking place. Because essentially, our role as trustees is to help govern and support the functioning of IFF in trust for you and in trust for the Indian public more generally. So from hopefully this weekend onwards, we'll have all of our previous board meeting key takeaways and resolutions updated. And if you ever have questions, you can always reach out to us. We will also, we already make a lot of information about the finances of IFF public. I'm going to paste some links in chat that might help some of you. Uh, one, the uh, all information regarding uh, transparency and finance, some hard work done by members of the staff, particularly those in ops like Shivani and others. We also have rules and policies that guide how we take organizational funding. Because the primary purpose of IFF, the public charitable trust, is to take public support you, the members, so that we can do our work unhindered without any form of bias interference. We also have many fantastic organizational supporters from the Indian tech sector who come in and they're free to support us. They don't get to determine our priorities and programs and what the staff are tied to. And we're keen to make sure all of that's very public and open. The thing I thought I'd also just briefly mention and then let you know Karthi come in a bit more is we're keen to ensure that the financial management of IFF is secure. The thing we do is we, for example, review the budgets prepared by APAR and IFF staff. We approve them. We're also looking at the larger 2020-2021 budget. We're also supremely aware of the impact that COVID can have on the larger economy and the ability for civil liberties NGOs such as IFF to be able to do its work. And as a result of that, we've been paying a lot of attention to long-term fundraising and sustainability. The IFS staff have done a fantastic job. Thanks to you, you all make this possible. You all donate to make it happen. And last year, across 20, uh, the financial year 2019 to 2020, we raised over 50 lakhs worth in terms of income. And the expenditure of that's also tracked. We've had around above 20 to 22 lakhs savings in the IFF bank account. But then we also use that to cover the leaner periods. And with the power, we sign off on a budget uh, an interim budget from April to June that was approximately, if I remember correctly, a projection of around seven to eight lakhs worth of income and around 11 lakhs plus worth of expenses, assuming that we have some savings there. But we will be doing a full forecast for the rest of the year uh, and a budget that we will sign off on because we wanted to see how does fundraising during COVID work. And I'm actually quite happy to say thanks to the fantastic work of you, the members and others, we will actually be doing really well. You all have stepped up. And that's really good. The staff are not resting on those laurels because we know there may be lean periods ahead and the work it's going to be two to three years of work just responding to some of the impact on our digital rights due to COVID. And that's something we're very aware of. Karthik, is there anything else that you wanted to come in with? Um, no, I think I just wanted to mention that in the last call that we had, we we like some of this we are also figuring out what is the right way to sort of surface this information transparently to you. So like I think we could use some feedback from everyone who's on this call and I guess generally from even the folks who are our donors and supporters who are not on this on what is this like what would what would y'all like from us in terms of how to structure this transparency like we can put out a budget that says 
this is where our you know line items are and this is where we are allocating money and this is what we're spending for but like if we're basically it would be more useful if we had like a feedback loop from y'all in terms of how you would like that represented because we have the flexibility of publishing this any way we want like ideally a transparency report if, if we follow it the same way that other ngos and orgs do it then it's very standardized but we have the option of being slightly more nuanced or interesting in how we do this so and uh, so yeah so basically if you all have any ideas on how we can do that we are very happy to take suggestions because right now what became apparent in that call is that we we only have our existing views on how to present this information and if you all have some uh, alternative ways to do this or if you all have I examples from other also who are doing this more interesting in more interesting formats we can replicate it um and i think like i think fatana posted a link to our forum so for those of you who have not joined i think that might be a good place to have this conversation and again like the point is that the money we raise is thanks to you and thanks to others so please give us that feedback and i'll also share we are keen to solicit other general inputs about how the board and ifs structuring work we're also working with the par and others about what are the various ways ifs continues and goes forward particularly across 2020 2021 for example right now we are a completely not for profit charitable trust with income tax exemption that's very important to how we work it's also limiting on certain things that we can do but any action that we take we're keen to like talk and solicit inputs and solicit as transparent a discussion as we can on it because the sort of approach that apart and ifs staff have set to the board is they favor radical transparency and we're very happy to enable that but we depend on your suggestion and feedback with that i'll give it back to apart uh for uh future calls we'll also try to allocate a great amount of time both for arvind and rachita uh and uh, uh, uh and i hope we can uh, actually also have calls which are much more segmented more than just being about the staff they can be calls between the board and the members we can think about these things together whatever helps the forum is there and i personally if you've seen i interact there and uh, there have been questions which have been coming up but before we step to them i just want to impress on one thing the work that we have been doing everything we are building it's during this lockdown and we are doing it with the sense of joy and affection towards our work supporting each other as team members but also as colleagues and we re do recognize each one of you we get this love affection respect and support from you and these are not words these are actual ways how you're supporting us with your money and i recognize what that means it means that uh, you are putting your financial security at this time and contributing from that towards our wellness our security as well recognizing how important this mission that we have embarked on and we have come a long a good way so where we started was a somewhat gloomy picture where we are ending up is a sense of rational optim optimism uh, optimism that we, what we are doing is possible it can be done during this lockdown and um, these are still early days but if we do continue growing our support with these strategies there are very tangible ways we'll be able to not only grow internally but actually impact and work towards our mission goals and that brings me to the final final slide which are the questions uh, and these are the top questions we gathered and let me also uh, request you to type in your own questions on the side if you do have them number 1 how can the common man make a difference i think the common man can make a difference primarily through civic education and as both farkhanda and shivania illustrating we need to change the vernacular and discover a language of digital rights which doesn't even have the word digital rights to it which is a demonstrable value to people which is our work having a rapid response going beyond these communities which require a very high amount of literacy and social learning and possibly even economic privilege right and i think that's when it will strengthen our work they can make a difference you enable them to make a difference and this goes beyond net neutrality because even net neutrality uh, and i come from that movement and other co-founders of iff come from that movement uh, are basically the movement at that point of time concentrated on a much more metropolitan set of people it was not wide based so you have to actually inspire a social value change in society and we are still struggling it is a long term process but you may notice certain changes in our vernacular which may happen over time 
how to avoid government surveillance and for how long I need to keep it. Arogya Setu uh, installed. Well, it's changing every day. As you may have uh, seen, our teams are litigating on it. We are incrementally assessing what risks it causes. And we do not have a honest and a complete answer for this. As our board chair, Ramanjit Singh Chima, who also chairs, uh, uh, who was also the Asia policy director at, uh, at Access Now, an international human rights nonprofit which works on technology. And I have most of my conversations with him are incredibly geeky. Okay. And uh, our conversation on surveillance was one such conversation where he, after his Shevning Cybersecurity Fellowship, uh, doing and studying surveillance, we were designing how can IFF, through its mix of advocacy and policy, change the surveillance landscape in India, reform it. So our learning has been, it's always going to be a much more incremental push towards victory. And even if you look at the much more Western liberal democracies pre-COVID, even there have had large issues on reforming of government surveillance. And it becomes a much more complicated issue because there's a great private sector buy-in now in which there is a fiscal interest in gathering personal data, which has become the natural uh, business model for a lot of uh, platforms and services that we utilize. So there is a symbiotic and a very strong cross incentive between government surveillance as well as the larger uh, 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 platform economy, so as to say. So, you know, to look at those incentive structures, we have to be more creative than look within the institutional corners of uh, engagement and also look towards centering this again as a public conversation. How does one contribute to IFF via code? So, for instance, our two data site projects on Section 66A and the panoptic plan, which is to map every facial recognition deployment in India, every one through a state government from the tendering process to how it's actually being deployed, except the actual cameras where they're located, because I think that's done much better with volunteers. So we do need coders there. It's being led by data kind Bangalore. We don't have the technical expertise, but Shivani as well as uh, Anushka are both holding interviews for it. And we have a great set of applicants. I would invite people who are from our engineering communities who want to devote a greater amount of time, volunteer for that project to send them an email. Their email IDs are their first names at the rate internetfreedom.in. When is my next IFF month arriving? Okay. And uh, this goes back to actually a picture I took in office uh, right before we started our work from home, which was, I think, about two weeks or three weeks before the lockdown. And that picture by itself um, was of packed packages of mugs for our last round of members. And uh, above that, you may also notice was a very uh, a strange picture of a board game uh, which is called Pandemic, which I brought from Bangalore, and it was telling of times to come. And with that really dark, dark joke, I'll say that we also have commission designs for the next round of months from one of our member, from one of our community members who is an illustrator, uh, uh, and you may have seen his graphic work now illustrating our social media properties. And it's a great mural. I'm just very excited as soon as this lockdown ends you get your merch and we want to do it even better our way of thinking around iff has always been that the merch needs to be reflective of our culture it needs to have independent value and you need to actually walk into your office put that bug down and your boss if you have one uh, and if you don't even better uh, but uh, your boss looks at it and starts uh, uh, and there's a uh, they get curious and they go to our website or your colleagues get curious and go to our website and it's it's swag it's 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 uh, denoting a political value with a sense of coolness and uh, what are some ideal privacy scenarios i would say that um, in the covid world right now it is to push back to restate what are our fundamental rights which are non negotiable even in extraordinary circumstances they need to come with a sense of legality that okay you are suspending and you're saying that for a month or till the pandemic lasts, I can't do X, Y, Z, but define what is X, Y, Z. Is the penalty proportionate? Is the restriction term limited? Is the basis of the restriction objective and plays into a healthcare priority, right? Because it's all about healthcare. So by using the pandemic example, 
the ideal privacy scenario is for people to have a greater amount of control over their own personal data which even goes beyond ownership because when you talk about ownership quite often it may mean that you may actually just consent to something you don't understand so it needs to have perpetual rights attached to it for instance your right to get something corrected even if you have signed it away right so these are some ideal privacy scenarios which we may look at finally suggestions outreach how can you explain the value of privacy data protection internet access to the non twitter public so go to our instagram page and you may discover what we are doing there we are using graphics and we are rather than pushing people back to text we are using infographics we have not been able to actually do the same thing which we did in collaboration with influencers for privacy and we are paying a greater amount of attention to making these issues not only speak in the grammar of people who are the non twitter public but making it tangible the conversation needs to have value for them so if you are talking about internet and 4g access we need to talk about for instance that day devdatta brought it up she says we need to do something about the andaman and nicobar it only has 2g access and it's a pure uh, it's a pure infrastructure issue so how do we popularize this make it the pan india issue is a phrasing of phase internet for all work and these are ideas and conversations we have perpetually now and this is something which we are centralizing in our thought process in our advocacy efforts as we go forward localize our content yes that we urgently need to do it and i think technology can play a big part there our website development process is a bit stalled we need to again accelerate it it's encountered a bit of bumps both due to uh, our inability of being sophisticated product managers in way how we could get it executed and being too ambitious but also in terms of the covid related impact some projects have taken a hit and three is uh, any involved should yeah and uh, i think we need to interact with you more i personally tried through the forum but if you would like to do something more with us please do give us uh, more ideas if you would like a call just with our litigation team and the volunteers in our litigation team do let us know us we want to set more of these interactions up not only for members members will get preference in several things we have also discussed internally that members will get first uh, order of picks with regard to being there for our virtual events because server capacity will be limited and then we'll open it up to public but we'll keep these kind of what if you may like to call them charchas or you may like to call them virtual meetups or uh, town halls whichever vernacular works for you we want to keep more of them because these feedback loops are so important for us to learn and to grow and with that i'll just uh, try to bring this to a, a closure but before we do that i'll just search through the chat box so if we can unmute people for a second and if they may want to also say something or just jump on jump in here we may budget about 5 or 10 minutes for that shivani if that's fine and if people want to stay along for that we are here as staff i think you guys should be able to turn on your microphones now if you join via audio towards the beginning and can you also guide them in sense of uh, uh, where that uh, uh, icon may be shivani sure um so under your under apar's uh, face and the presentation you will see three icons there's a microphone icon on there and once you turn it on it will turn blue that means that it's working i believe smith you've turned it on yeah uh, um, yes uh, So, uh, first of all, I this is my first call. Uh, I just joined very recently when Amol popularized on Twitter. So that's how I got to know about it, and that's how I joined. I really want to thank you guys for doing an amazing work, especially during this COVID nineteen situation. So really great job to all of you involved. So that's one. Now, one thing that I wanted to highlight, and that is something that I've seen time and time again. So this Aragya Setu app. So my father actually is a doctor. He is an ENT specialist, and he's in Gujarat uh, right now. And one of the things when I was talking to him about this, what came out was that he thought government was actually trying to help. He was like, "It using this, we have been able to limit the spreadability of the virus." As you said, right? That extraordinary times commit that. So when I was trying to tell him that how this could be abused down the line and what are the downsides of it. he was like what what do i do with this problem that i'm facing i'm seeing so many patients i don't want that to do it 
And one thing that I've seen, even in the Western countries, whenever this issue comes out, it's always a divide. So there is a segment of people who are literate, who see it long term perspective, how could it harm others? But then there is also the other segment who are looking at short term and we never empathize with that use case. Ki, oh, we do need to solve this. Maybe the solution would be to have such contact tracing, but it's limited in a way. So I felt that is something that is missing. And the way we should look at the people supporting it from their perspective, perhaps in case it was my father uh, and I didn't do a great job. But I think that is something that is missing. Uh, at least that is my take on it. And I feel what, what can what, what would you suggest tangibly we can do? around this because you know it's always been our vision to make the tent broader right and mm -hmm. if you're just going to reach out to the people who already know these things we are doing an awful job so it's actually persuading and changing or building a sense of empathy towards other points of view if we do it others will do it with us as well so how do you think we can do it being anchored to the kind of values that we hold um, I, I know some part of it may be engaging with people with a greater amount of respect, going into constituencies which are not being traditional sympathizers of digital rights, but any kind of practical takeaway you have there. So I, I believe that one great thing that happened, especially in the US, is that both Apple and Google came up with an API which had severe limitations. Uh, so you couldn't abuse the way you could abuse Arugya Setu. Arugya Setu is definitely much more fungible in this scenario that after this use case is solved, it could be abused in a greater way. And I'm not just saying that the power government is wants to abuse, but it could be easily abused if it falls into the wrong hand. What I felt what was missing here was that while RG Setu itself was a startup, I think no greater technical folks actually stepped in uh, or there was no consultation that I felt was completely missed out on the implementation side of it. So that is one, the implementation side where the ball was dropped. And the second thing I would just say is that I feel apart from one or two or three political leaders that I could think of who have some sense of how technology works or how it could be abused, most of the people who even support this are doing it out for a political mindset. So I think one way to is to just make sure our, the way we communicate through IFF or any other medium is in a way that it does not have words like digital and all of that. And we definitely have an alternative to that because what they'll say is, okay, if you take away Aragya Setu, what do I do? How do I track this? How can I scale this? I think those will be the questions that will come up. And I don't have a good answer to it, but I feel that if we involve more technology spaced uh, companies, there could be a way that this does not get abused. I, I find this comment super useful and in fact it's also a legitimate concern like how do we get more tech people to address this and the reason why i come in is something that i discussed with the par but even with others has been that one of course we need more doctors or health professionals to also explain what their preferred view is and sometimes when you speak to really the epidemics list they in fact keep saying that don't call this contact tracing it's not contact tracing uh this is an exposure app as of like now as you know apple and google are calling it um this is something that might be useful, but uh, yeah, if you were epidemic specialist, we may not recommend that. So it's about engaging with that community. And hopefully if IFF does more of that, uh, we also would try and work with people like you or even others to make that shareable, right? Like where the messages that can go literally into WhatsApp groups or elsewhere, helping share that forward. But perhaps more importantly, you need to have this alternative pro-tech, but pro-privacy, pro-long-term solution. And that's something we hope to do more of, both on COVID and the sort of larger epidemic response effort as well, but even in other areas. And this is a little bit early stages, so we will probably, you know, bake it a bit more and come back to you. But we're hoping to activate the sort of more active conversation with tech developers, designers, and others, so that sometimes there might be just alternative thinking or writing. Sometimes there might even be better alternative product development. Because one of the things we did discuss as a board with the PAR has been that uh, we want to, of course, push back in public campaigning, litigation, or policy. But sometimes you also want to help promote or even create alternative tech approaches. So that's something we're trying to do. But again, we can do much more. And any help, any suggestions are really, really welcome because there's a lot we can do in limited time. OK, so uh, very quickly and
Uh, I would like one more member or two more members to come in, please. Um, please uh, 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 unmute yourself, unmask yourself. Uh, please participate. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen the chat window as well. I've, ta I've taken those notes. I'll address them uh, after we can have some one-to-ones here as well, right? Uh, hello? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, Shubham, uh, loud and clear, yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so I think on the what, uh, what Ramanjit Singh Chima said on uh, building tech solutions, I think uh, I'm a privacy researcher in uh, based in London right now. And uh, so, but there are, I feel, a lot of uh, good Indian researchers in the, uh, across IITs, as well as I believe few of the NITs who can be involved. For example, even for the uh, contact tracing, I was working with a team at IIT Bombay who are, work, who are building a privacy preserving protocol in India. And they had designed a protocol which was very similar to what France designed in April and they had built a complete app as well around that. So with solutions, I think, uh, of course, they need more exposure and I feel like uh, there isn't a very clear pathway for these technologies to come in and then go throughout to the reach out to the government. Um, I think that's super useful, Shum, and like uh, that's more than a. I think uh, it's incredibly valuable because that's a larger level uh, uh, suggestion you've given us. Uh, again, um, as I asked earlier, what do you think is one actionable step IFF can do to help this journey? Right, um, and I know you are yourself recognizing limitations and challenges in it. So if you can just type it out or send me an email or Siddharth or any one of us our email later on also if you may think about it uh, it'll be useful um uh, i'm really sorry about this we are going way over time but i want one more uh, if one more member can please uh, come on uh, and i know even if you just want to repeat what you've typed in uh, please do uh, uh, come in hello hey hi rahul hey hi Hey, I am Rahul. I am a student at Aligarh Muslim University. I'm an electronics engineering student. And first of all, thank you for all the great work you have all been doing so far. Thank you so much. And I have one question for you. So yes. I'm still a student and I don't earn <laughs> at all. So I, I can't help you out monetarily uh, yeah. in that sense. But I do want to help out and, and you know, like, like fight for this greater cause, as you, as you might say. But uh, like, can you can you help me? Uh, like identify what are the spaces where uh, as a volunteer i can go out and you know like help out so uh, i think uh, um, that's better take uh, this question is better taken up by shivani and like we are really hoping to build community with the kind of volunteers that we have uh, unless of course they are project side volunteers in which either if you have tech skills and uh, your skill level and your time availability is more predictable then you work on a specific project so um, general uh, help by itself can be towards uh, uh, community building. Shivani, would you like to take this? Sure, sure. Uh, thanks so much, Raul, for pointing that out. I think that I think uh, we definitely look towards uh, students and younger people to engage with us and help us. Um, if you, if you, I think what would be really helpful is you if you could just tell us a little bit about what you're interested in, what you, what are you studying, what are your skills, etc. And we can add you to our volunteer database. You can reach out to me anytime at shivani at netfreedom.in. I've also pasted my email on the chat box. And we'd just be super happy to get you on board and see how we can involve you more in the work that we do. So yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. So I, I'll, I'll send you an email. That would be yep. So to bring this call to a close, I will just say that um, as much as you are looking forward to your next mug, I am also looking forward to my next mug. Okay, and uh, let's let's keep our fingers crossed. Uh, let's hope this lockdown lifts. We do know that we'll be dealing with a high degree of uncertainty in our lives. We'll be dealing with a lot of challenges towards our fundamental rights, our digital freedoms. But sometimes it's important to step back from the outrage. Sometimes it's also important to focus on what are our limited victories, these incremental wins. These give us the stamina. These give us the learnings 
what we can carry forward what is possible in our world they make this hope possible and we carry this hope in our work as much as we realistically know things are going to be different things are going to be challenging but then again i hope all of you uh, uh, we are able to dispatch your mugs fairly soon and you can think about them over a cup of coffee or tea which you may like with that uh, as well so thank you everyone for your time thank you everyone for your support if you did like this call uh, don't only give us feedback in private but also do let others know that uh, what kind of organization you are help create you are helping to create and um, is this something you like uh, what can we do to improve ourselves and um, give us a shout out on social media um, uh, sadly without the mugs again but um, we will be having a next uh, quarterly call now that we have the tech set up with a higher amount of discipline and please do enjoy the weekend even if it involves streaming um, uh, a show or uh, uh, having a, a, a call uh, and uh, uh, talking with your friends or just uh, switching off the laptop and digital devices and just picking up a book so i wish you all well thank you so much you are an integral part of iff we genuinely believe it we read and respond to every emails so please keep them coming and we look forward to this journey in the uh, in the in, in during this covid world with all of you Take care. Bye-bye.